Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Wellcast of Change Ministries. I am Pastor Gerald Roberts. We here at Change are a body of believers dedicated to helping God's people by advancing them, nurturing them, guiding and equipping them. We would like to welcome you to come out and worship with us Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Thursdays for Bible study at 7 p.m. The address is 44014 14th Street. We're located one block south of Grand River Avenue. All right, we're back. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Lord. I want to thank you for pressing your way out tonight to our Thursday night Bible study. I'm going to ask Mother Roberts if she will open up in prayer. Amen. <laughs>
he can feel. Um, <clears throat> Habakkuk's first complaint um, in um, chapter 1 and 2 it just, it just brings back today, just brings back the mind to me of today. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear, even cry out unto the abides, but thou will not say. There's so much going on nowadays. I mean, People are crying now, but I guess they're crying in the wrong way, crying to the wrong people, but that touches me because it's, I just see so much violence and things, and I just uh, want to point to you. Amen. Amen. Brother Roberts wanted to comment this. Sister Solis is going to run over and she's going to come over and discuss question number one. wanted to share with you because I can remember um, from in my teens you would hear write the vision and make it plain uh, the, the heralds would run with it but not until oh, I was reading I guess maybe five years ago and I knew what the scripture said but then I, I really read it because when it says it won't tarry that means it won't be late so you just stand in faith because it won't be late. A lot of times we want things and we want them now, but it clearly says it won't be late. Amen. So Sister Shalice has question number one on the assignment. So I'm going to ask that uh, she can run over here and discuss that real quick. So he, he, he was questioning why did he have to witness and be and be subjected to the people doing wrong. And then later on when he got an understanding that his attitude was no better than theirs. He was he even though he wasn't doing the same things that they were doing, his attitude was no different from theirs. Because he was judging them and questioning God as to why did he have to be subjected to it? Why did he have to endure that? And, and, you know, in our discussion earlier, we were talking about that God allows us to go through things to, to, to get our faith to the level that he desires. And a lot of times we want to abort the mission, we want to abort the work that God has for us because we don't like what we're going through or what we're doing or what we're subjected to because it don't feel good to us. And because it doesn't feel good to us, we don't want to partake in it. Amen. So, Brother Darian, you have question number two. Um, number two states that who was raised up to march through the land and possess places that were not theirs. And in, the, in, the, in this chapter, it says that the Chaldeans were the ones who uh, were raised to march through the land. Who remembers during the Bible study lesson, we talked about the Chaldeans and we talked a couple of things about them. Uh, what was it that the Chaldeans had done that caused the Bucca to have this anger towards them? And Sister Carla asked a good question during Bible study. If you look at today, who has the same attitude or behavior as the Chaldeans back then? Who wants to tackle that? Brother Derek? If I'm remembering correctly, I think it was um, us, like, as a people, like everyone. So, yeah. 
He said, because we're no different than they were. Okay, Deacon Durrell Roberts, you want to comment? Basically, we're no different than them because we as people go out and take what's not ours, don't want to work for it, don't want to do what we're supposed to do, yet and still we want to blame everybody else. We go out and we take what we want, whether we deserve it or not, whether we step on somebody else's toes or not, we go and get what we want to get, however we want to get it. And that's what uh, the Chaldeans were doing then. And then we use it as trophies. Yeah, I did it. Yeah, I got it. That's how I did it, because I felt like it. That's what we do as people. Amen. Amen. And so the question was, he raised them up. Amen. And he, they were raised up to march through the land and possess places that were not theirs. God put them in position. And he allowed them to have the attitude that they, he allowed them to do the things that he did. And there was a purpose behind it. And so question number three, uh, Deacon Phil has, and it talks about the purpose that God ordained the Chaldeans. Um, one and twelve. Thou art not from everlasting, O God, O Lord my God, my own holy one. We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O oh oh mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. And I got, they were ordained for judgment to, to gain, to achieve um, correction, to establish correction. I mean, what, there wasn't a better place where they were ordained to, to gain and to achieve, to establish correction. Amen. God, God was using the Chaldeans, uh, you know, one of the statements that I said, they, they were a cruel and vicious army of people. And God was using them to correct the attitude of the prophet and the attitude of the Israelites. He, he allowed them to do the things that he did to get them in position and where he desired for them to be. So he allowed the Chaldeans to, to come in and and, and wreak havoc in the land and destroy and kill and, and, and do all the things that they did because God was using that to, to uh, rain judgment on the Israelites and to correct them, to get them back in their rightful position. You know, the Israelites were God's chosen people. They were the ones who he had favor on. And because, but because their attitude and because they were not like him, they, they, their, their commission to God and their commitment was to God and, and that You'll be our God, and we'll be your people. That's the promise that Israelite, the Israelites made to God. But yet still, you find all throughout the Bibles that their, ba their behavior was not that of children of God. And because their behavior was not that of children of God, God raised up this army of people to inflict them, to cause correction in them, to humble them, to get them right and back in right position with them, and he caused it for judgment on them because of their behaviors. Amen? Right. Brother Robert says a comment. I look at that as a two-edged sword, as you said, because uh, as I look today, I keep comparing that to now. Because not only did he raise them, um, the Israelites were being judged, but so were the Chaldeans. Because he said that nasty, bitter nation. And they were being seen and judged also. And as the Israelites were corrected, when God it said he marched over the heathen, so they were brought into judgment also. And we see that today going on in our government right here. Um, these people have been raised up in power and they've done everything and they've been exposed for judgment and now they're going through correction. Right. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. You know, when, when we studied the Beatitudes and, and, and you remember that Beatitudes said the meek shall inherit the, inherit the earth and then also says the blessed are the peacemakers 
for they shall be called the sons of God. There's an attitude that the children of God should have. Amen. You know, if, if we're humble and we're, we're, the Bible says that we should present ourselves as little children. You know, and that means that we're submitting ourselves to God, that we're allowing God to have reign and rule over our lives. And then it said, you know, in the, the, it says the humble shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are peacemakers. The attitude that we, we should have is always to do God's will and always to do his work. Now, none of us are perfect, and, and we all get distracted at times. But even when we get distracted, we have to have enough humility within ourselves to realize that we've gone astray from God's will for our life, repent, and go back and get back in, in order with God. And back in line to what this work, this, the work is that he's looking for us to do as his people. Amen? Deacon Kerr is going to discuss with us how should the just live and what does that mean? Okay. Um, about the 2, verse 4. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Um, what I got by this question is the people, um, how should they live? How, the, how shall the just live? The just is the righteous people, the people who are in good standing with God, who believe in God, who are faithful to God. And they do this by being, by their faithfulness and um, being loyal and um, believing in Him. So I believe that's what I believe. Um, that how shall the just live? They should live by faithfulness and being believing in God and being loyal to Him. And Anybody want to add anything to that? Sweets? So he said being patient. Amen. Say so it might not happen just when you want it to, but if you live by faith, you know that it will happen. Amen? Amen. He's looking for, God is looking for people who are, who are just that, being obedient to him and trusting him. And our being obedient to him and trusting him, it, it, it allows us to have the attitude that we live by faith. Because even though we can't see how things are going to happen, even though we don't understand how everything's going to happen, but our faith tells us that if God said it, it's so. You know, we've been studying it as well. Those who live by faith have the attitude that whatever's going on in my life is well. Because I'm trusting God and I'm believing God. And my Mother Roberts. And then Brother Darian had another question. I just brought to my mind, I remember um, when I it's been several years, I think it was uh, Pastor Price was teaching one morning. And he was teaching that there are some things we shouldn't see, even though it's a reality, because we should be living in faith and seeing what's coming and not what we actually see before us. Explain that. Well, I think Shalice did an excellent job of explaining it, because that just means uh, you can't look at it as it is. But you're looking at what will be. By faith, you're looking at what will be and what will come to pass. And that's the way he was explaining, even though you may see turmoil all around you. And he was saying, don't see it, but see what is to come. But just like with, with Darian when he was talking about going to college. My faith tells me he's going to go to college and he's going to get all the scholarship money that he needs. And he's not going to have to worry about that. And don't look at what is and don't now. look at what it is right now, even though no, he, no scholarships have been offered yet. My faith tells me that he's going to have more than enough. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Derek? Well, uh, I kind of feel foolish for asking this, but um, I 
been confused on like what does it mean to like compare it or like I really don't get that phrase. Okay. He said, what does it mean to inherit the earth? What that means, okay, the Bible tells us in Psalm 38 that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. And so when it says the meek shall inherit the earth, it means that when our lives add up to God's will and we live according to his word and how he wants us to live, that because everything that is here and all that is came through him, that there's nothing that he'll withhold from us. It means that he will bless and give us everything that he has as long as we're living according to his will. So when it, so the Beatitudes, it's saying the just, the, 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 the meek shall inherit the earth. It's talking about when you have the attitude of humble. And you know, the Bible says that the pride, the pride, the proud are headed for a swift fall. And so when you humble yourself and you don't think more highly of yourself than you should, then the Bible says God will exalt you in due season. And so the attitude of humility, it puts us in a position where God can then position us in the presence of great men and then allow things just to happen and, and, and fall into our lap. We don't have, and, and he told the Israelites that they, they were going to possess cities that they didn't build, live in houses that they didn't build, they will eat food that they didn't harm, that they didn't prop, prop to farm for. Them. And so that's the same blessing, the promise that he has for us. If we are his children and we're living according, he's going to allow us to be blessed with abundance. So that's what that means. When it says here on earth, it means that whatever there is that out here, as long as you live in from God's will, there's nothing that he'll withhold from you. Mother Roberts. Then Deacon Phil. I think it not only means now we can put everything that was said, I'm in agreement that that's what I believe, but it also, I believe it even goes further because it says the new heaven and new earth, and that we will live again and we will inherit. Because as Christians, we're, and this is going to sound so, we're living to die to live. And we should be living our lives now to die, to live again. And that's why I see it not only as being meaningful now, but meaning after also. See, we're dead now until we're alive in Christ. And as a Christian, when you're alive in Christ, you have a new life. But we're still, while we're here on earth, we still have to go through walking this earth, but we're walking in this earth to die and live in Christ. Deacon Phil? And I got, I, I mean, uh, obeying the word, living in God's truth, living by his directions, having faith, not only faith that he's going to do things, but faith in yourself that you live in right. Amen. Amen. And you know what, because and also the Bible says faith with our works is dead. And so we also have to remember that the level of faith that we have in God empowers us to go out and receive and seek and take the things that God has in store for us. Because if you don't have faith, then you, you have faith. But if you don't go out and obtain the things that God has for you, it won't do you any good. Brother Dennis.
Yeah, because that, that walking in by your faith means that even though, you see, when we walk by sight, it means that I can see that chair over there. And I can see that chair, so I know if I walk over there, that chair is there. And I, I can go in there and I can sit in that chair. But my faith tells me that God told me that there's a place for me to rest over there. Even though I can't see the chair, my faith tells me that when I get over there, God has something over there that I can rest in. And so that's where that, that that's when we talk, we walk by faith and not by sight. If God said he's going to provide, then my faith tells me I don't have a check. And I don't have one coming in the mail. But I know that God said he's going to provide so that there's something he has coming my way. Okay. Sister Shalice, you got a question?
and he has the lower He has, he has praying who's asking the Lord for the, um, the, cover, the, the glory of the heavens and the fill of the earth with his praise and the brightness was the light, like the light. When I was reading this, it's like Habakkuk had already seen what God had done. And so once he seen it, he started going towards more to what God than what he seen before. So it's like basically he was being an intercessor for the people who didn't see what God has done or was doing. And he was just basically asking for the price of life, that the people could see what God was showing him. Amen. Amen. He was looking for, uh, he, when he hit this attitude shift, there was a shift in his attitude. And now he was praying for God's uh, Wrath to not to be not to have wrath, but for God to be merciful on the people. And then also he asked God to allow them to continue on and revive his work to get back in, to be back to be able to do the work that God called him to do. So it, so we have to have an attitude shift. And once we have an attitude shift, then God allows us to be positioned to do what He called us to do in the beginning. Amen. 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 So the next question is, what did the Lord thresh in his anger? Who knows what thresh means? I, mean, I, I was thinking about this earlier because, you know, uh, somebody asked me about uh, why do I use uh, words like that? And so uh, who know, who understands what thresh means? Anybody? Okay. Deacon Daryl, Deacon Paul. Things up. Okay. Put Paul. Okay, well, it, it started, actually started back in verse 12. And it said, he says, uh, and I'm going to read the New King James Version. It says, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. Amen. God was, that's when he started to destroy. Habakkuk had witnessed God destroy the Chaldeans. The very ones who he had raised up to teach them a lesson. Once Habakkuk changed his attitude and he positioned himself back before God, God then started to destroy the enemy that he raised up against him. And so here he's talking about that he destroyed them and they trampled over them. And then 13 says, you went forth for the salvation of your people. In other words, God went forth and he did this to give the people of God back their power, to, to strengthen them and put them back in their rightful position. And it says, um, your salvation with your anointing, she said, for salvation with your anointing, you struck the head from the house of the wicked. In other words, he, he, you know, he split it to the white people. He cracked him in the head, you know, and, um, and, and of the wicked, amen, by laying bare the foundation to the neck. In other words, he, he, and you have to understand, he literally cut the head off of the wicked. And that way they, they can't come back. They won't come back because the head was destroyed, and then once the head is destroyed, the body can no longer live. Amen. The brain, the mind, the very thing that caused them to think and function the way that they were, God destroyed it so that He can raise back up His people. Amen. Mother Roberts. Good morning. 
go back to the threshing because if you go and watch a threshing machine we don't, on the farm, we, we don't know what that is. Well, they have them now because they use them now, but you see it is grabbing stuff and throwing stuff one way and keeping the good, and that, that's not any good. It, you just see it flying everywhere. So it's, it's the same thing when you thrust through a barn and, and you're separating stuff. So is the threshing the thing that they use when they're cutting down corn and wheat? And wheat. And, and so, so, you know, we, we, we're modern young people from the city. So you got to explain that to I was born in the city. Your husband was. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul. Okay, amen. Amen. So the girl said he covered it. So that lets us know as the children of God, uh, when we read that, because if you read in Hebrew chapter 12, God's, the Bible says that he chases those whom he loves. His children, he corrects those whom he loves. Amen. And so here in this passage of scripture, God, we, we read earlier that he was allowing judgment and correction to come to the children of Israel. So he was allowing them to be inflicted by the Chaldeans and the behaviors of the Chaldeans because he loved them. And he was allowing them to get back in right position before them. And then once they got back in right position before God, then he began to manifest his blessings in their life. So my question there is, what does it mean to be back in right position before God? Now, we all, we all profess to be saved. We all profess to be children of God in the room, amen? So then, what does it mean for us to be back in right position before him? What's, Sister Jackie said to be born again. Okay, what does that mean? It means that you change the way of living and now you're living with Christ. Amen? She said you change the way of living and now you're living with Christ. Okay, so for the believer... What does it mean to be living with Christ? Because you have a lot of people who profess to be believers that may not be quite living with Christ. You know, with your lips you say you love me, but your actions, you know, you, your heart is far from me. You know, your actions, they don't demonstrate and don't say that you love me. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. However, we say that we love him, but then when it comes down to living according to the word of God, we do everything but that. So, Brother Paul, you raise your hand. What does it mean for the children of God to be in right relationship? Yes, we have to be born again. And once we're born again, there's an expectation for the children of God. What is it that God is looking for from us that he can then be begin to position us? Sincere heart. Um, the next thing was is that um, what you said was um, well, I think it was obedience. So if, if you if you can't live if you can't um, be obedient to my word, if you don't have a sincere heart and you don't have love in your heart, then you're no good to me. So just like she said, if you basically covenant, once you become saved and you repent and you turn away from your sin, then now you have to do the right thing for the right reason, not for anybody else but for me. Okay, Sister Shemise. Hold on, hold on. To me, what it means is like, if we see we doing wrong, we're not going to keep doing it and like repenting and say we're going to stop doing it. But if we turn around and keep doing it, we're going to 
God doing it and walking in faith and know that God, he took me, well, he didn't take us through it, but he let us go through it so that we can know not to do it again and come back into his word and know that, like, if he, let, he's, like, he lets us go through things so that we can minister to other people. So, like, we won't just be able to talk to people, but we can experience what they experience so we know how to get the instructions to them so we can relay it better. And, like, it also means, like, to just keep walking in faith. Like, have faith. Don't think that God turned his back on you. Because he never does. He always forgives them. No matter how many times we do it. It may be times where we be like, okay, no, God won't forgive us because we've done, done this too many times. But just know, like, you can turn your life around at any point in your life. You just got to know God. Amen. Mother Roberts. Not too much else to say. <laughs> Um, but when we say that we have accepted Christ in our life, okay, and that we are followers of Jesus Christ, it means we follow him. We follow his teachings, we live according to his word. And it says, uh, we, as we dwell in him, and he dwells in us. But you know, when you say you're saved, and you say you're filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And we're out there or in here cussing somebody out. But yet we're saying we got God's Spirit. And when we get home behind closed doors, we're doing everything else. Then we're not in right relation. We're claiming to be. But we're not in right relations with God. And uh, 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 this is just one thing. Least when you repent, I heard someone say it means to, to uh, because it's cure was teaching Sunday. It doesn't mean 360, it means 180. You don't go back to it. When you do, there is a punishment in that going back to those things that you repented from. It's a difference in forgiveness and repenting. And, and a lot of times we don't think about that. And a lot of times when we're out of the church and away from our brothers and sisters and we're doing things, we forget that if you say God is within you, he's right there and you're trying to get him to do whatever you're doing. That's why we know that anything we do that's wrong, we do it willingly. Because the spirit in you, if you have the spirit of God in you, when you start to do it, you know it's wrong. To be his sons. 
And when he qualifies us to be his sons, I, I like the way it says it, that we're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And then it tells us later on that he conveys us. It means that he picks us up and he just catapults us and he just moves us across some things so that we can be the people that he desires for us to be. So when we, when we make the decision to live for God and to walk with him, this decision has to be real. And it has to be to the point where you're fully committed with, with, with not only your ways, but your will. You have to really discipline yourself. And you have to make a decision that no matter what, I'm not going back to my old nature. I'm not going to turn back to my old will because now I've made a decision that I want to be right. And I want to live right. And then we have to pour everything we have. And, and it does take work. It does say, well, a lot of us want to say, well, you know, we don't have to work. Jesus did. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. The Bible says work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. It means that you have to have a reverence for the Lord. And the reverence that you have for the Lord allows you to be fearful of doing things that will disgrace him, things that will separate you from him. And that requires that you do some work. So as long as it requires that you read your word, it requires that you pray. It requires that you meditate hear from God. It requires that you separate yourself from some people. It requires that you stop doing some things. It requires that you don't go some places. And as much, once we make that decision, then God can get it, then God can then position us as his people so that he can't pour out his blessings upon us. The bucket had to change his attitude. A lot of us, we ain't getting what God has for us because our attitude is wrong. We think we still think we're entitled to something. We still think God owes us something. Somebody said, somebody said, a member here said at one time that, that uh, I quit smoking weed. So now, why am I still struggling? Because your attitude, you might as well still smoke weed. Because you think because you stopped smoking weed, God owe you something. No, you owe God something that he didn't allow the marijuana to destroy your lungs and destroy your mind and make your hormones go crazy. And I, Aziz had a question. Um, I was listening to what they were all saying before he started talking. And it's easy to say you're saved by God, but it's even harder to be close and be actually saved by God. You actually have to pray, not do a cute praise in front of everybody to impress them. You have to actually meditate, read your word, know what you're doing. You actually have to do the commands of what God gave to us. He said you actually have to do the commands. The Bible says not only be hearers, but doers of the word. Amen. He said you actually have to do it. Amen. 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 That's my death for you. Amen. 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 Brother Lips. Oh, when I learned that part. When I learned the lesson today about being a doer to the Lord. It's like the young man said, you got to be faithful. You got to be a doer. When you can say, I love the Lord 24 hours a day, if you're not being a doer or being an actor to God's word, then you don't trust God's word. And, and one more thing I want to say, that when you go to God, you got to open up your heart. You don't come to God like you come to me. You come to God open in the spirit, in all by faith. And you be honest with God because God is not a toy. And when you talk to him, he hears everything you do. But you know what? He already there for you. It's just you got to come to him. Amen. Amen. And we do have to come to him because he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So, you know, uh, for all of you who are waiting on God to show up at your door and do something, you have to open up the door for God to do something. In other words, you have to make a step in your life so that God can do what he wants to do. 
If you don't open up the door, he can't come in. He's not going to force his way into your life. He's not going to force you to do his will. He's not going to force you to read the word. He's not going to force you to live according to the word. He's not going to force you to pray. He's not going to force you to trust him. But he will allow you to reap the benefits of it if you seek him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. And I believe Brother Paul had number eight. Amen. Well, well, that's a good question. You said, why is it that when you know you're doing right, other people are trying to convince you to do wrong, and then they're trying to convince you that doing wrong is right? Well, one thing for the answer is that people in the world, they don't understand righteousness. And the Bible says that the way that a man thinketh, that the end thereof is destruction. So there's a way that we think that we think of as right, but the end of it is destruction. And so a lot of people, they're thinking that they're doing right. And, they, and yes, they think that when you're trying to live for God and you're trying to do right, that you're crazy because they can't understand that because they're not in relationship with the Lord. The Bible said, tells us in John that, that the, those in the world think the things of Christ, the things of God are foolishness. It's totally crazy to them. And so they can't understand when you say that, 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 that you're not sleeping around. They can't understand when they say, when you say, this is my, this, I, I, I got a tithe in, in spite of the bills that I have. They can't understand when you say, I trust the Lord no matter what it looks like. 
Because for them, because they're not in a relationship with the Lord, it's foolishness. So they'll never understand that. But that's why we have to be confident in who we are and know who our God is and understand how he does what he does for us. Because regardless of how you think about me, I'm confident about what God says. So my faith tells me, even though it might look crazy to you, in the sight of God, it's going to cause blessings. He says, the, bless, the Bible says, the blessing of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrow. So the things that we do for God, it, it will be, we know without a shadow of doubt, it's going to bless us. And it won't grieve us. So when you take your 10% your and you give it to God, you're looking at it as, well, I only get $700 a month, and I'm giving God 70 And you're looking at it from that standpoint, you're not realizing that, that God gave you the whole 700 And the little part that you give back to him, he gave a promise in the word, he's going to keep the devour away for your name's sake. So the blessing that comes with that, even though the world don't understand it, my faith tells me I'd better have God seal and approve on my name than $70. Amen? Amen. Brother Z said his hand. Let me ask another question. Amen. 
And then we have two final comments, and then we're going to wrap up. But I got a quick question for you before we have. Have any of you seen any of the footage for the pastors of L.A.? Any of y'all seen any of the footage for that? Okay, good. Amen. This is a TV show called The Pastors of L.A. Amen. Uh, uh, amen. You know, we have to be ever so careful at, at, at how we represent God as the body of Christ. Amen. Because, you know, uh, man, because we, 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 we say that we're his people. We carry his name. But then we do things that are totally outside of his will. And then we're saying to the world that this is okay. But we have to remember who we are. And we cannot sell out our compromise for a couple of dollars. Cannot sell out our compromise for a couple of dollars. Because the Bible says they'll get gang with never prosper man anyway. Amen? We're going to receive your comment that unfortunately we, we do have to wrap up. Amen? Sometimes to get us to turn back to them. 
But after we come out of those things, we have to get back. He said, like he said, he said, if the tree don't bloom anymore, if the, the nothing produces in the, in the field, if, if the herd never produces anymore, I'm still gonna praise God. I'm still gonna live for. Him. Because I know my, my, my relationship with him is not his on what he does for me, but who he is in my life. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to thank you for coming out tonight. I pray that something that we discussed tonight stirs you. I pray that something that we discussed in the book of Habakkuk causes you to live even more dedicated for the Lord. I pray that something that we discussed tonight causes you to go out and share this word with somebody else. Those of you who are viewing me in the webcast, God bless you. If you want to come out and join us, feel free to come here at Change Ministries. Every Thursday night we're here at 7 p.m., 4400 14th Street in the city of Detroit. If you can't make it on Thursdays, join us on Sunday mornings for our Sunday worship service. We'll be glad to have you. We love you. God bless you. And we look forward to seeing and talking to you soon. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.